heavens. So one more time. Hare Krishna, everyone. Hare How are you all? Fantastic. Oh, my God. I like this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am Krishna Nandini Devi Dasi and uh, am the chairperson for the Grass Division team, which Prahar and Devi Dasi will explain a little bit about it. But we'd like to welcome you all to our workshop, and we really appreciate you coming to hear us out. Um, we've developed a course that we think is going to revolutionize the Grahasta Ashram. And uh, this is an unabashed uh, marketing <laughs> for you all to really have some appreciation for this course and the work that went into it and the heart that went into it, the commitment and our desire, following Srila Prabhupada's desire, that marriages and families and people in general in our movement be happy and pe peaceful and Krishna conscious. So, um, uh, Tariq, this is my husband Tariq, and together, as a lot of you already know, we have 19 children. And I have given birth to 10 children, five boys and five girls. Uh, our youngest is um, eight, Vishnu. And he's like the totality of all to put together. It's like Krishna's ultimate arrangement to make sure that we're finished having children. <laughs> it's Vishnu. Um, but no, we're very, very pleased with our children and very happy that the Lord has allowed us an opportunity to take care of his children. Um, you know, as Khalil Gibran says, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of God longing for himself. And as Vaishnavas, we know that the Krishna is always duplicate, re reproducing himself all over for greater enjoyment. Um, my husband and I do uh, an agency called the Diocese Ed Family Institute, which works with couples and families to enrich and strengthen. So what we do with the Grahasta Vision team, we also do in our home cities and our home lives. Um, that's it for me. And we'll have Prahar tell a little bit about it too. All right, my name is Prahar Nadasi. Um, I've been a devotee for about 35 years, but I'm also a social worker. I have an MSW and I work in uh, that professional field in Toronto. Um, but I also have a long history with ISKCON. Um, ISKCON and now professional field. So I got my first job at 40. <laughs> I was living in the temple before that. But uh, given my age, I've got quite a bit of experience now. So, <laughs> um, so I just uh, I wanted to give you a little background about the Grihas Division team. Pardon me. You got one first. You three? I thought. Oh, I'm so, let, let Tariq introduce himself as well. Is that door <laughs> shut there? As you can see, we are anxious to tell you about the Grihas Division team. Um, we want you to know who's up here. She said she had a husband, but I may not have been that husband, right? But uh, I am. That's what makes me famous. I'm married to Chris Nadine and David Dossi. <laughs> and my name is Tariq Salim Ziad. And if you don't believe I'm famous, we're in a book called Cleveland Couples. Yeah. And uh, it's with 40 other inspiring stories in this book about our love story. <laughs> That's a portion of it. So if you Salim in my name means peace. It means I want to have peace. I want you and I to have peace when we interact together. And I want all this room to be at peace. And I want the whole world to be at peace. And that won't happen without a commitment of action. A commitment of action. So, oh, you were supposed to introduce yourself. And then I introduced myself and say that you're going to talk about the oh, Houston Vision that's Team. All right. But the thing I want to say about the Houston Vision Team um, because I don't want to talk too much about myself. You already know I'm famous, right? And you know why, right? All right. So uh, some people in this room have been very aspiring to us in the kind of work we do. You have the Grahasta Vision Team, Audacity at Family Institute. And Grahasta Vision Team has a vision. And in that vision, it includes seeing the higher Christian community so strong with family life, so strong with family life, that others in the outer community, such as the Mormons, who are known to have strong emphasis on family life, right? And Dr. James Dobson, 
with his focus on the family. You hear it every day on the radio. That those would come to us and say, how do y'all do that? Come to our radio program. Come and talk to us. Wouldn't that be fantastic? If we would have that much impression on the outer community. So that means if uh, the Mormons and, and uh, Dr. James Dobson are asking us to come and share, that would mean a whole lot of other people who are having difficulties just like we are. Of Over 50% of the marriages are ending up in divorce. So if you want to drive a car without taking lessons on driving a car, what's going to happen? Trouble. You're going to have trouble, right. So your host division team, she will tell you what your host division team is. For Thank you. So it was four years ago at the Festival of Inspiration here in Uvendala that the whole idea sort of came together. Um, there are a number of us in ISKCON who work as family therapists and counselors. And so we got together, we pulled a meeting together, we ran around and found, and you're a counselor, right? Come on, into this room. We got everyone together and we decided we had to do something. Um, ISKCON's wonderful, Srila Prabhupada's wonderful, but we've made mistakes. And as a result, there's been a lot of dysfunctional marriages and a lot of dysfunctional families over the years. We were immature, we just didn't know what we were doing in the early days, the arranged marriages and all of these things. Um, it caused a lot of difficulty for us. Um, so as a result, now our children are at that age, looking at marriage, and they're having difficulty too, because they didn't have the stability in a lot of these situations where they could build a strong family and marriage of their own. And not only that, a lot of the people, uh, the devotees coming to our temples now are from India, they have uh, the challenge of coming and integrating into a new culture and dealing with family life in that context, which is not easy either. So um, we thought, let's get together, let's see what we can offer. Um, it hasn't been done before, let's put our heads together and put some programs together that might help ISKCON and the devotees in the service of Srila Prabhupada. Um, so all the members of the um, Free House Division team are professionals in the fields of counseling, uh, family therapy, teaching. We have one doctor who's now just finishing her PhD in family therapy. Um, so in that context, we work together as a professional group. Um, so our initiatives are based on some of the education we have and our, our life experience in our professions. Uh, we have a monthly um, tele telephone conference and we meet once a year. Just a few weeks ago, we met in North Carolina, which was wonderful. Um, and I just wanted to show you in, in four years what we've been able to do. Um, it's hard to see, I know. But um, we have a comprehensive family and marriage course called Strengthening the Bonds That Free Us. Today we're going to go through the lessons very briefly just to give you a taste of what the course can offer. And... Um, you're free to approach any of us to arrange for some of our teachers to come to your temples. Um, we've been all over the world, um, uh, South Africa, Ireland, England, um, several courses in Canada have been Australia. given, Australia Canada. is coming up, India, so um, this course is now catching on. Um, but you'll learn about the course as we go through today. Um, we have a mentor program. So we can go into your community and train mature couples who've been married a long time and are spiritually and materially strong to be mentors for new couples. And we actually have a training program to give people the skills with which to do that. Um, we have health, uh, healthy relationship retreats, workshops, seminars, and conferences. And we're planning um, a marriage retreat, much like the Jopper retreats, in the next year. Um, we, have, we wrote a pledge of support for leaders to sign. Um, this was actually uh, given as a proposal to the GBC in Mayapur, and it was approved unanimously by all the GBC um, to, that uh, they would be community leaders in supporting and strengthening families. Um, we, have, uh, we provide premarital skill building. We have educational brochures. We put together a online and a paper form a booklet of all the counselors in ISKCON who are available um, for contact by any devotee. And we have a website where you can see um, all of these things and more. 
www.vaishnavfamilyresources.org. Okay, so now we're just going to start going through the lesson so you can get a taste of what the course is all about. For those of you who have um, our brochure that we passed out, on the last page it says, the Grahasta training course. If you don't have a copy, Evelyn, do we have more? For, no, she put them on each side. Oh, okay. Um, the Grahasta training course is a four-day interactive seminar teaching such topics as values, perceptions, expectations, communication skills, etc., and this uh, course is very interactive and very much fun. Uh, we've given it twice in the United States, and there are many of the couples that we just saw here that are still talking about it. So our first um, overview, and as Mother Prahara said, we're just going to whet your appetite today. So to to whet your appetite. Okay. You have a copy of this. I just want to briefly go through them. I'm not going to read through them. I'm just going to highlight a few points. Um, when we went to Cleveland um, three years ago, we had a meeting and put together all of our initiatives. We wanted to, first of all, map our principles and values. So we were writing them on papers like this. The whole house was full of papers. You couldn't even tell what color the paint was. <laughs> it was fantastic. And then from there, we actually took all of that information and honed it down into 12 different principles and values that, that we um, promote in our courses and in our work. Um, so alignment with Srila Prabhupada, of course, this is very important. That we, um, we promote the teachings and example of Srila Prabhupada, um, but we also promote the fact that they need to be applied with time, place, and circumstance. What may be the norm for family life in village India is probably not the norm in New York City, but both could be totally Krishna conscious. So we have to keep that in mind. Spiritual growth and progress. Uh, family life is an ashram of spiritual culture. The home is an ashram. Personal growth and character formation are integral to spiritual development. And be, being a grihasta helps you develop growth and character. Renunciation is, of course, the ultimate goal, but this has to be developed. It has to be mature, and it has to be internal in that person. It just doesn't come out of the air. It's something you work on, and grihasta life can help you to achieve that goal. Spiritual equity and material difference. Again, we stress unity and diversity under Srila Prabhupada's guidance. We help couples to negotiate their respective roles uh, in Krishna consciousness according to their own personal and cultural backgrounds and their own strengths and weaknesses and personal aspirations. Um, men and women have equal rights to practice spiritual life. At the same time, we understand that men and women have different physical and psychological differences. They, they do have differences, and that's okay, as long as you avoid the unhealthy stereotypes that have plagued us in the past in this world. Positive and realistic vision. This is very important. One needs to enter the Grihasta Ashram with the correct attitude and expectation. We have to avoid the misinterpretation of spiritual truths. We have to avoid inappropriate personal and social paradigms. That's very, very important for a marriage to be successful. We have to avoid negative attitudes, unrealistic expectations, because when you do that, if, if you do that, you dampen your own enthusiasm in, in spiritual life. And if possible, we promote support from elders. Now, none of us had that. If I'd asked my mother about my marriage, she probably would have cried. Because <laughs> he had a Sika. <laughs> oh, that was a long time ago. Um, re mutual respect and appreciation. This is very important in marriage. You must have respect. It's a base basic Vaishnava value. Without mu mutual appreciation, it's not possible to develop intimate relationships. It's just not possible. So that has to sometimes be learned or practiced or helped along the way. And one, in devotional life, you need to learn intimacy without familiarity so that your marriage can work on the spiritual platform. Commitment and dedication. With determination and unshakable commitment, one can surmount the inevitable hard times that come with marriage, married life. And they do come. Hard times come. Um, but... 
what we help people to understand is that affection and love, which is what should be in a marriage, affection and love must be the radical idea. That is developed with service, service to Prabhupada and Krishna. Open and honest communications. One needs to set aside time for good communication with spouse and children. You must maintain open dialogue. You must avoid denial. That's ruined a lot of marriages in the past. Personal and social responsibility. Entering the Grihasta Ashram is an opportunity to take on more Krishna conscious responsibility. Devotees can preach effectively by demonstrating this responsibility, integrity, and other exemplary qualities. Economic development and prosperity. This is another thing that we need to work on as devotees. We need to generate wealth and prosperity. This is um, very important in married life. And um, we have to avoid the unhealthy poverty mentality that has plagued us in, in the past. Charity is also essential for Grihastas. Grihastas should be supporting the other ashrams. And um, that's part of our mission in Krishna consciousness as family people. Focus on children's welfare. Of course, nurturing spiritually, spiritually qualified children is the main purpose of, of married life. Children should never be, be neglected. Um, and you must take proactive steps to avoid any kind of abuse not only with your own children, but other children. Financial st stability is necessary. Parents should develop affection, a sense of protection and responsibility to all children. It takes a village to raise a child. Uh, Krishna consciousness should be relevant and accessible to children. And parents should seek support and training when it comes to child rearing. It doesn't always come naturally. Family love and affection... It's natural to have affection for others, especially for Vaishnavas. Krishna consciousness is not just a matter of stifling worldly affection. Family ties are very important and help people to become Krishna conscious. Stable emotional backgrounds where family members feel wanted and appreciated is essential for children's spiritual and personal growth. There is a great value in strong sense of community as traditionally expressed through the extended family. And now that we're into our third generation, this is something we need to work on. Regulated, balanced, and exemplary lifestyle. So this should be the goal for householders. And uh, it's an important feature of devotee life, regulation. Devotees moving to the second ashram should expect that there will be major changes in their life and in their lifestyle. And they need to maintain their spiritual priorities while they're going through those changes. And that can be exciting and enlivening. Preaching without practical example is not effective. Devotee householders should demonstrate exemplary lifestyles that others become inquisitive as to what underlies their success. This devotee is so Krishna conscious. He's married to his kids. Wow, how is he doing that? I want to be like that. That should be our goal. So these are our... Um, 12 principles and values, and um, Krishna and Anini will explain how they're integrated into our course. Thank you, Brian. All right. <clears throat> There's a part of your agenda that says we want to ask a question. Why is strengthening the grass, the ashram, so important? And we uh, did the principles and values, which is part of the course. But we want you all to help us answer that question. Why is there a need for us to take a separate initiative to strengthen the Grahasta Ashram. Aren't our scriptures enough? Don't we have everything in the books? So we'd like you all to answer that the question for us or help us answer it. Why is this important to do what we're doing? Is it important? Oh, I, um, I think Melissa had a question on one point when she said that we're now into our second and third generation. So we need help putting things in context. Okay. So the okay, you need help putting the family, spiritual family life in a proper context. All right, the rule. So, <clears throat> because although we have all the information in the scripture, um, 
it, there's an assumption that there's an understanding what good aspect life is. Right. There's an ideal and then there's an actual. Okay, so we need practical help in bringing the scriptures to life and understanding it. Okay, Prabhu? Like what Shila Prabhupada said, like to, to be a good example for preaching. Right. So, so examples to bring out how to do this is really what you're saying. Prabhu, do you? We need help uh, learning how to apply the scripture and the instructions for life and so we, we need help with practical application. Prabhupada explains this jhana, which is the knowledge, and then there's vijana, which is the practical application of knowledge. So how to take our scriptures and make them alive in our life is a very important aspect of what we're doing. Anybody else? Prabhu? To help us mature in devotional life. To help us mature in devotional life. Mata. Um, there's been a, a strong um, renunciation spirit promoted in this time over years, and you know, basically a, an unhealthy view so of we have to life. So change the unhealthy paradigm that we've been dealing with in our past. Very, very good point. Um, Similar to that. Uh, separate our fanatical misunderstanding that we've had in the past and that has been propagated by early ISKCON to a more realistic, uh, practical viewpoint of what married life is. So, Absolutely. how do you, how do, you, you do that? <laughs> Anybody else, Prabhu? By uh, studying us up to succeed in marriage life, we become more attached to ISKCON Sri Papa because we feel like we've been Set up to succeed. Great. So, mm-hmm. to help me to be success makes a more of a close attachment to our spiritual life. Um, the children see happy families, they also be happy to be part of it. When children see healthy families, they'll be happy to be a part of it. Nobody wants to be a part of anything unhealthy unless they're not quite well. Um, Prabhu. Um, the future is fun since most of the majority of devotees are grahastas. Yeah. It's so the majority of devotees are grahastas. This, this is a very important um, point. I'm not sure exactly what point is going to be churned out of this, but just coming from my background of what I would call a very loving family, but not Krishna conscious, coming and in, become involved with Krishna consciousness, living, having lived most of my adult life, and I never got married. Um, so I'm thinking how many people may have also seen the movement and just backed away because uh, they didn't see a situation in which they could comfortably become married and engage in family life. In other words, they didn't see a, a place where they could tie together marriage and spiritual life. Right. Um, um, the, the, the very good point, because research is showing that most people who are taking to some kind of religi- religiosity today are doing so in essence to save their families. So a lot of people are going to Jehovah Witness and Mormons because those have very, very strong family-oriented programs within the religion. And to add to your point, I, I sent a friend to a temple a few years ago. I was out of town. And they went and they said, Krishnandini, was anybody married in that Temple, there was a lot of devotees there. I said, you know, almost everybody there was married. They said, you would never know it. I don't want to go back there. You know, I want to bring my family into something where I see loving, you know, relationships. And that really scared them. And they had to ask me, was anybody married in that temple? And most of the devotees were married in the temple. So that was really not a good <coughs> uh, program. Okay. Anybody want to add what? Uh, same, uh, future of ISKCON, um, all the other ashramas are supported by the Grahastha Ashram. All other ashrams are supported by the Grahastha Ashram. So if we don't have healthy Grahastha Ashrams, what does that mean for the other ashrams? Right? Sometimes we have to make that translation. You know, because if your foundation isn't healthy, then what's the result? Okay, anybody else? Okay, so very good. Thank you. All right, one of the lessons 
um, in our course, as Prahari said, is the principles and values. So another lesson that we have in the course is the roles of husband and wife. And um, we say that the aim of this particular lesson is to help students to clarify an understanding of the respective roles of a husband and wife, particularly in terms of trying to live a Krishna conscious life, and what are the similarities and differences between devotee men and women, and how do we negotiate those differences so we can be healthy. Also, what are some of the tensions that we as Vaishnavas experience? So within our tradition, the Vaishnava tradition, we have certain expectations, but then we live in a society that has other expectations. So what are some of those tensions? And how do we develop strong values to adjust to that? Then once we go through those different uh, lessons in this lesson, how do we apply in our own lives a proper adjustment of the role of husband and wife? So I just want to do one of the real quick um, uh, exercises that we have in there. And just, you all are going to tell me what, who do you think should fulfill this role, either the husband or wife? And this role as well. So we have protector, provider, nurturer, uh, caretaker, um, and educator, and of course there are other roles, but you know, these are fun ones. So who should be the protector, the husband or the wife? Who, who, someone said husband. Whoever said husband, raise your hand. So the majority of you said husband. Did anybody say wife, by the way? I said that. Oh, oh. Okay. You said wife? Okay. So, some of you said wife, so we'll put that down and come back. What about provider? Who should provide? Both. I'm not telling you what to say. You can say whatever you are comfortable with. Okay. So both. So here we're saying both should but even under the protector. Okay, so what we just experienced was a little bit of some of the tension that we and our families have uh, experienced. Is that right? Negotiating. Oh, you should protect. No, maybe you. But really, get, get an understanding of, you know, that it could be both. And part of our working with you in this course is to help you come to a healthy conclusion of how that works for you based on your scriptures and your circumstances and your situation. What about nurture? <laughs> okay, so what we're dealing with is the reality and then the ideal, right? Right? So ideally, we both should nurture each other and our children. But the reality is often it is the wife. Is that healthy, though, that it's just the wife? No. So what we want is healthy grass for life. Everybody say, healthy grass for life. Caretaker. Who, who do does that? Uh, again, the reality, you know, sometimes may be that it's one of all. And um, again, the course helps us to come to healthy realizations, how to practically do this for a win-win situation. Okay, educator. Who takes the role of educator? Oh, no. You are very progressive. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, we, we're just giving you a little taste of each lesson, and I, we can't go deep because of the time. Because we want you all to say, wow, that course, we got to take it. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, I guess, tell me if you're going to do readiness for marriage. Readiness or preparing for marriage. So we talked about automobile before. I think I'm going to use this analogy a little bit. So if you're going to get ready to purchase an automobile, what's the first thing you're going to do? You had your hand raised earlier about something. You're going to raise, you're going to go buy an automobile. What's the first thing you're going to do? You don't have to stand by an automobile. You never bought an automobile before. Yeah. Okay. 
just have the money. Yeah, look, look out for ads. Yes. Look out for ads. Look up the advertisements. So advertisement can attract your attention, right? <laughs> So one thing you gotta look at the ads, and some ads may look better than other ads, right? And who is you gonna see? Oh, it's you. Uh, research. 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 Research based on what? Research based. Knowing what you want. Knowing what you want. Now, how many of us, when we were two years old? knew what we wanted. <laughs> and how many of us, since we've been two years old, have been trained to know what we want? So this is where coming to this course has some advantages. You're now being shifted in a way of thinking and preparing and knowing what you want. You're now being prepared. You're now being shifted it was they call a paradigm shift. So there's a certain way we've been looking at things, and when you guarantee, when you take this course, well, we can't say guarantee, you have to be the ones who have taken the course. So what uh, we would suggest that you do, find ones who have taken this course in New York and Washington, D.C., and some of the other places they have taken this course, and say, tell us, because we are seriously, seriously considering taking this course. And you are seriously considered so far, right? See, okay. this is how she's saying. <laughs> well, I think I am. So we can have a few more classes to go through, and by the end of that, I want you to be seen. Yes! <laughs> like that, okay? All right, get ready. So, so prepare for marriage. The most important thing I'm going to go with is with the research. But the research is based on what is it that I really want more than what I want. What is it that I need? What is it I need? How much you can pay for it? <laughs> how much I'm going to, how much I'm willing to how much I have, how much I prepared to do this comfortably where there's no strain on me in the car because once you get in that car and you're driving it, it takes maintenance. maintenance. <laughs> you know, we go to movies. In fact, I'm listening to Sammy Davis Jr.'s life and it's talking about one of his wives to where she, she went to the store she bought something. In fact, it's talking about him. He went to the store. He buy he buy he buy a lot of watches and give his gifts. But you, you know, if you go and keep buying and you don't have back there to take care of that, pretty soon you're going to run into trouble, right? So to maintain what you're seeking for as a long time goal, as we said, what is our mission earlier? What we want to see is dust and dust. But you have to prepare the ground for that. You have to prepare for that. So this sheet is called preparing for marriage. Uh, what we're doing is giving you two or three minutes of something that takes hours that we go over. And this one is talking about paradigm in marriage, paradigms in marriage, reasons for marriage, expectations in marriage. And But we want to do a self-assessment. Who am I? You know, you know, I want all of this. I want the best car. I want this. But how am I prepared to actually pay for that and maintain that? So what do I need to do to get myself prepared? So I need to do a self-assessment. So we go, we go over that. Are you all with me a little bit? I have a question about expectations. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you're saying that you had the expectation that you were going to categories for each couple for yourself. Is it safe to have expectations for your partner? Or should you have expectations for yourself? Well, well for what your we partner? start with is first to, to get your, your personal expectations. Okay. And then we will work with how that you work with someone else when they have their own individual expectations and how you put them together. 
How do you mesh together to have mutual benefit? How do you mesh together to have mutual benefit? So they'll be talking about your compatibility. How to arrive at what is our compatibility? How are we going to work this out? What do you have as your interests, your concerns? What are your expectations? What are, you, what are your healthy communication skills that you have and which ones do I have? How can we work together and improve those? What is your, your background? What background did you come from? You know, we go at some of these real, real issues. So um, I want to say one thing about the auto. And the thing I come up with. Uh, if you go to buy an automobile and they have a good deal on a stick shift, if they have a good deal on a stick shift, you know what a stick shift is? You know what a you know what a stick shift is? I'm saving you for the like that. You know what a stick shift is? Yes. Okay. Can you drive a stick shift? I certainly can. Okay. So if they had a good deal on a stick shift, you could consider that, right? Yes, but when you're driving a stick shift, you can't. Uh you know, talk on your cell phone. Can't do all those extra things. So she's got to consider, yes, I can drive a stick shift. It does have a good deal. But what is it that I really want to do that's going to be beneficial to me to have a stick shift versus an automatic? So that is a little bit of that particular place. Okay? Because um, as His Holiness Bhakti just Swami said, that for everything there's a price you have to pay. So when you want to have a healthy marriage, of course there's a price you pay. And we're okay with paying a price because we know that everything has a cost to it. And part of the price for a healthy marriage is getting properly prepared, having realistic expectations, and that particular lesson goes in depth about it. Okay, the next um, lesson we want to give you a taste of is called Communications and Managing Conflict. And then the aims of this particular lesson are to empower the participants with communication and conflict resolution skills, particularly in relation to the Grahasta Ashram, as essential skills to build close and caring relationships free from unnecessary conflict, and also to counteract any negative consequences of exposure to cultures that have marginalized our need for open, honest dialogue, and especially on subjects related to the Asta Ashram. And you know, sometimes we have a sense that there are things that we shouldn't talk about or that we should take for granted. Okay, we get married and we're both devotees, so shouldn't everything else work? Well, the reality is no, it won't work unless we make it work. Um, this, this marriage business, like any other business, will work if you make it work, if you work it. And so part of that is getting the appropriate skills. So in the class, we teach uh, reflective listening, res respectful speaking. We teach turning complaints into requests, because we know that what happens when you complain? Anybody? You just have to keep complaining. Usually you don't get, things don't change. So if you request, this is a tool, a simple tool, to help get a change in response to your uh, problem. And we teach another communication skill called finding the pony. You know about that? Oh, okay. So finding the pony is a way of taking a, an apparently negative situation, seeing the good out of it, and making it work to both of your advantage. So that's another skill that we teach in the school course. Mm -hmm. But now we pass out to you a poem that we'd like all of you all to repeat with us. Because this is our healthy relationship mantra. And we repeat it in our class as part of the communications course. And it really addresses all of the different skills that a healthy marriage needs. And so we'd like you all to say that with us if you don't mind. Now if you get to the point where it says marriage and you're not married, just relationship. We have relationships with others that we want those to be healthy as well. So, um, okay. Uh, okay, you want to share. I know this by heart, but sometimes I get a little nervous because this point of healthy marriages is so exciting and urgent with me that I have to. Just keep grounding, okay? No excuse, you don't get born. <laughs> <laughs> so, please.
please say this as a as a a, 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 a prayer, sort of that this is the um, this is the energy that we're putting out into the universe. This is what we want. Okay. We're in this together. The good times and stormy weather. We're willing to do the work it takes. Be a team. Pray. Make less mistakes. We want to get better together. With faith in Krishna that our marriage will be great. We're learning to better communicate. To speak what we want with respect. To listen to get the most effect. We want to get better together. Our goal is to be each other's best friend, to get skills so our relationships won't have to end, tools to manage our time, children and money, to avoid the mess and go after the honey. We want to get better together. Trust, forgiveness, respect, yes. Lying, cheating, fighting, no. With consideration, cooperation, and devotion, we can flow. We want to get better together. <laughs> okay. Something else. Okay. We have fun in this. Yeah, we're just fun. Um, what do you think is the greatest cause of tension in marriage? What's your guess on that? Money. 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 That's it, money. The biggest cause of tension, not only in devotional lives, but in non-devotional lives as well. Across the board, when you work with families and couples, it's all money. Well, there's other issues, but that's the biggie. So, of course, we have a lesson on money. Um, I want to ask you a couple of questions. and I want you to think in your mind, yes or no for yourself. Yes or no? This is the devotee statistic that the money is the biggest problem in the devotee's marriages? No, it's tension over money. I'm not saying lack or, or too much money or not enough money. The dealing with money. Dealing with money between the couple. Um, I'm going to ask you four questions. I just want you to remember whether you said yes or no and add them up. Whether How many yeses, how many noes? I have no savings for myself, kids, education, or emergency. So think, is that a yes or a no for me? I find it hard to say no and feel guilty when I do. I can't let go of old things. I keep them even if I don't use them anymore. You're laughing at me. <laughs> I have a hard time collecting sufficient fees for the services I provide. Okay, so that's just a few of the many that I could ask you. But, so, out of four, how many have four? Four. For yeses. That all of those are. Okay, how many have three? Okay, how many have two? Okay. If you have two or more, um, you would um, have a problem with poverty consciousness. And this is something as devotees we have to deal with. Poverty consciousness is a big problem in ISKCON. It always has been. And it's an incredible tension in marriage. Um, see, there's po poverty consciousness and there's prosperity con consciousness. And really, the way that you train your mind to think and the way that you plan your future, if you have poverty consciousness, you're going to be poor. If you have prosperity con consciousness, you'll likely prosper. And as Grihastas... You need to prosper in order to support the other ashrams and to raise your family nicely. So, I'm just going to read you eight principles of prosperity. The recognition of God as the supreme owner. Everything belongs to Krishna. Careful stewardship. Since everything belongs to God, shouldn't we use his resources in his service? So, it's not yours anyway. Thriftiness. Waste not, want not. Give and you may receive. This is one thing people don't understand. If you give, it, it always seems to happen that it always comes back to you, and even more. Live a regulated, disciplined life. Early to bed, early to what rise makes a man, a person, healthy, wealthy, and wise. Live simply, but think highly. 
Cultivate a prosperity consciousness and eliminate poverty consciousness. Realize that God our Creator is our best well-wisher and wants us to prosper. It is the direct will of Krishna that we have abundant health and capacity to care for ourselves and take responsibility for others. And to share your success with others. Be an example, teach what you've done, and share the benefit of your successful techniques and skills with others. I want you just to think in your mind of your biggest financial challenge. Just think of one thing. Could be my mortgage. Could be my my uh, inability to get the money to fly to India. Could be anything. I don't know what it is. Just think of it in your mind. Now I want you to think of that particular issue and then decide whether this is an external issue. Is it just that you don't know how to deal with that, raising that money and dealing with that money? Or is it an internal issue? Are you thinking there's no way I can get that money? There's no way I have um, the ability to do that. Because, see, one is poverty consciousness and one is just need for skill. So we go over both of those things in our course. We actually go through these kind of budget building tools. <laughs> Some people are like, whoa. Um, but this is what it takes. This is what it takes to figure out. We go through all of these things. You actually spend time to look at your money situation and to understand it. And we're not accountants, but, uh, <laughs> but um, these are just basic tools for becoming stable in householder life with, with your Lakshmi. And um, again, dealing with money is a skill. And uh, you, know, you need to learn these skills in order to have stability in your marriage and in your relationship. And now, what is it, Kira? Uh, so our next um, lesson is titled Affection and Phys Physical Intimacy. And um, the aim of this particular lesson is to help the participants view sex in a healthy and suitably shastric manner, especially regarding the tensions between its potential for both degradation and spiritual upliftment, and to look at any paradigms that are counterproductive to this aim. Also, to help the participants develop suitable methods to talk about subjects that may be a little difficult to talk about, and to deal with different institutional things that cause conflict. So I, I think one good way um, to start with this is is um, there's this quote, and I want you all to tell me who said it. Um, affection is the need of the soul. So was it Socrates? Was it Stephen Covey? Or was it Srila Prabhupada? He said that. She said Srila Prabhupada. Who else? Stephen, Stephen Covey. Socrates. It, you all, the rest of you all have an opinion? Or? Stephen Covey. Yeah. Affection is the need of the soul. Okay, actually this is a quote from our beloved Jagat Guru Srila Prabhupada. Yeah, and he said that affection is a need of the soul. And so when we talk about affection in terms of the Grahasta Ashram, sometimes this gets to be a bit tricky because all of us have different ideas about what affection is. Some people think affection means sex, or some people think that if you're affectionate, then you're not properly Krishna conscious. Hopefully that's not, that one's dying out. Because if you study all of the um, examples that we have, there's so much love and affection between devotees that it's, it's like an ocean of affection. And because we had our own misconceptions about what it meant to be renounced, we got a misunderstanding of that. So, um, i just like to do a quick brainstorming activity on uh -huh. To just have you all share, what are some of the things that our society tells us about love and affection? And then what are some of the things that our scriptures tell us about love and affection? And then what are some of the things that we think are necessary to have in our Krishna consciousness movement? I know that's a lot. Okay. General society, yeah, because what in the course we take the three, we take a look at three different paradigms. You know how the outer society, because most of us still 
you know, live in, in the art of society, then how does our institution and then what is our reality? So, how does society talk to us about love and affection? Anybody? It's the basis of everything. It's know, the basis of affection, you know, marriage, and uh, I think that's the golden opportunity. Is this what the society, the society says? Society, you know, they says really promote it. it. That, you know, that, they that, advertise it. So, so are they advertising love and affection? Well, it's more commercial. They advertise love. Very commercial. They advertise love. love. They advertise love. Lust and love. love. Right. Selfish. Okay. Selfish. 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 All right. Yeah. Interactions. Okay, anybody for Boo? Uh, Hollywood conception. A Hollywood yeah. glamour soap opera time. Superficial. Yeah. Sometimes I unrealistic, like who's turning it all. Unrealistic. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? It's just um, limited to personal gratification. Limited to personal gratification. Limited to personal gratification. Selfish. <laughs> oh, you put selfish. So that's kind of. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's unscientific. It's unscientific. Okay. All right. So I think we have enough on that one. Now, what do, what does our scriptures say about love and affection? Anybody know? It's based on service. Unconditional. It's unconditional. Anybody else? Prabhu? It says we have to learn to be detached. We have to learn to be detached. Detached. Detachment. Detachment. Okay. Anybody else? Affection is natural amongst family members. Affection is natural amongst family members. And that real affection has to do with helping nurture the other person's soul. Okay, real affection has to do with nurturing the other. Krishna Chandra. Okay. Krishna Chandra. Krishna is at the center of real love and affection. Okay. Real affection is intrinsic. It's, it's intrinsic. It's, it's it's not artificial, it's something that's inside of anybody. Okay. So, and then the final category is, um, yeah, what do we think as, as individuals think is necessary in regards to love and affection? It should be unconditional. It should be unconditional. We think that we should be attached. Detach. Oh, detach. Does anybody know the definition of detachment yeah. according to Rupa Goswami? If it's used in the Christian consciousness, then actually that attachment's good. Right. Yeah, because I think in the early days we got a little confused about that when we thought that detachment meant to, you know, yeah, abandon and not touch and all those things. But really, real attachment and the highest attachment, the most scientific attachment, is to realize that everything belongs to Krishna and therefore should be used in his service. Now what that means to me on a personal level is that the Lord has given me this husband. So asking, well, how do I treat a gift from God? You know, not like this is my husband or my man and I can do what I want. No, this is a gift from God. Uh-oh. Now i got to really, really exercise love and respect and caring and sacrifice and forgiveness. And that should be a mutual thing that he does for me. So this is very important. So the reality now, so we've dealt with the societal paradigm, the scriptural... Do, do it. Well, this is, I think it's a uh, necessity to understand it. it's a choice. A choice. It's not just that is there or is not there. Yeah. It's a choice we have to work for. Right. Yeah, very good point. Uh, you know, that, that if I could share with you all yesterday, I was uh, praying to Sri Prabhupada and, and St. Prabhupada, you know, as always when I have an opportunity to share, I think back to what Prabhupada has given me, and it's so much. And um, I'm always thinking, how can I give back to you? And one of the uh, instructions that he gave me was to do what I'm doing, to work with families and marriage. So I prayed this prayer, and then I took rest, and I dreamed 
that, you know, my husband and I were uh, in the, the room, and these children kept coming. Now, we got a lot of children. So, and I'm pretty much getting to the point where I'm glad they're growing up, and, you know. But these were not our direct children, but they just kept coming in the room, and they were, they were not clothed, but they were little children, very innocent and cute. And I woke up, and I was very puzzled. Okay, what, what are you saying, Prabhupada? And I really got an understanding that Prabhupada was sending so many of his children to us, and they were presenting themselves, you know, naked, if you will, just sharing their hearts and souls. And this is what we do in our work. We listen to a lot of devotees and people that share their very core of their beings, and that we have to be responsible for them. You know, so this sense of, and it's our choice, it's our choice to take that responsibility as a service for Srila Prabhupada. So Kunti is saying choice, we have to choose that we want healthiness in our lives. We have to choose that our service to Prabhupada, to Krishna, to Guru is this and that we're willing to work for it. And if we make that choice, that's really the minute independence that we have that Krishna has given us then Krishna will give us all facility. And we have to know that. We have to be confident about that. We are not helpless to remain unhealthy and to not grow. If we make this choice, Krishna will give us all facilities. So I'm glad that Conti and brought that point up. I've talked too long. So. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Now, did you, uh, you just see, it's a, t- it's a the topic is uh, physical tendencies and whatnot, so it's a lot of that comes up that people have concerns. So it's, uh, in the class, you have the advantage, it's like in this room, it's uh, a variety of people from a variety of places, and when they share, you get an opportunity to share more because we break down in groups, and you can hear other people's sides, and there's a form of sharing right with, you know, your your, your uh, class members that you're feeling confident that I can share some personal things that we can handle in an appropriate way that we all can grow. So that's an advantage, believe me, of being in this group and having many people to share with. So there's uh, exactly how's the title of this one. It's called um, Serious Conflict, Separation, and Divorce. Serious Conflict, Separation, and Divorce. Uh, that's what has prompted us to do this, this coursework. Uh, we said we have 19 children, but we only have three together. And so the, the others, they've had a disadvantage of one of the, the, the parents. So I have children that grew up without me being present for them every day while they're growing up. I had my son last night, he had lost his shoes. Somewhere if he finds his shoes around here, probably hit in the sand somewhere because (laughs) somebody hit him in the sand. He could never find them. I was carrying him around on my back. We were in the tent. He was sitting up on my lap and I was sitting in the wet grass. I wasn't able to do that for all of my children. And that hurts them, and that hurts me. And probably some of you, you heard from your experiences that you didn't have an opportunity to have everything you wanted from dad, everything you wanted from from mom, let alone what you needed. So this is why we want to make this commitment. This is why we want to make ours that we've made, and this is why we ask you to make your commitment. So those children can grow up with both of their parents. Okay? So, what are some of the danger signs once you get into marriage that there's a, there's a little problem going on? So, we're discussing this. I'm going to mention a few of them. Um, the, rela- the relationship lacks affectionate dealings with the sweet words, gifts, or service. Favor has gone out of it. You know, when you first meet someone, and, uh, you know, Kristen has it to where. Uh, yes, a lot of it is physical attraction, a lot of it is the sound of the voice, a lot of it is little different dynamics that work all at one time and you say, wow. You know. <laughs> you, can, you can relate to that, right? I have to say one thing. I'm very familiar with the Mother Christian, I mean, his husband, and he's an expert at being 
being a gentleman, okay? And he's also a romantic. And so I'm sure life is just very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> That's a compliment, by the way. Had it not been for the grace of God, I would not be standing here before you now. I have a unique history, and part of that history is in this book, mm -hmm. where my wife took my clothes after we were married and put at the feet, not the feet, the steps, the back steps of my mother, because she did not want to face my mother and tell her I was through with your son, mm -hmm. because she had pretty much begged her looked at her a certain way and say, please, whatever you do, stick with him. Because she knew she was good for me. And she had known the different experiences I've had. And she knew this was what would make it okay. And she knew this, and I'm exaggerating, would have it to where I could be here today, to where she and my dad can be proud of what I'm doing in the Grahasta Ashram building capacity working with my mother was a Canadian, too, by the way. That's probably why we have such a pen to get out. <laughs> We're all the That's same. <laughs> Canadians are good people. <laughs> so technically, I'm half Canadian, but since 9-11, I can't get my Canadian ship. My brother did, but I, I wasn't able to get it. So dangerous signs of, of, of marriage. The couple, ha no, the couple has a um, general breakdown in communication. Communication is marked by criticism, ridicule, sarcasm, put down, and name calling. Now, the one thing I can say about this as we move on, because if you find yourself doing that, it's not the other person. It's something you need to resolve within you to where maybe you have some hurts in your life that you have not resolved. Can everyone hear me? <clears throat> that you have some hurts in your life that you have not resolved. If you are putting down people, criticizing them, saying things that you wouldn't want to say to yourself, get some help and resolve those issues in your personal life. My estimate, this is, and I'm not speaking for a grass division team, so maybe I should not say what my estimate is. But if you hear me, most of us are walking around with unresolved issues. Okay. So again, we're talking about danger signs in a marriage, but what's the sign of an abusive relationship? There's 12 that we've noted here. I think it's 12. Was it 12? Was, yeah, 6 and 6. So you have, uh, your partner has a history of abuse. You know, that's, you got to kind of know your partner. Maybe we shouldn't try to be uh, psychiatrists we shouldn't try to be, what do they call it when you're trying to save Social the world? Social workers. Social workers and um, saviors trying to save everybody else when we're not equipped. So if your partner has a history, then you need to go and try to get some assistance somewhere. Your spouse consistently tell lies and is generally devious. So that's just a couple, but there's 12. We want you to take the course and spend time working with others and we're discussing this, this takes days, days, two. This is a three day to four day course. So don't get scared. Take time out of your life to be prepared for the future. So then we'll talk about conflict resolution styles, ways that you can resolve conflict. Um, are there any legitimate reasons for divorce? So we'll discuss that. What are the consequences of divorce? And we know that we can add to our list. Really, you know, but you'll see you can add to your list. How do we resolve serious conflict? And with all the work that all of us have been doing over the years, and some of it was before we got to be Grass Division team, and some of it during and because of Grass Division team, and some of it just the outside work that we all do. All of us work with people on the outside, I think. Most all of us. So, are there any real serious problems that can happen in a marriage? Yes. Are they resolvable? Yes. How do I know that? How do I know that? Has been done before. By in whose life? 
problem really actually got resolved. So you can have confidence that you can work on it. But keeping in mind, not be a psych, don't, don't go way, way, way out beyond your lead, but have a little prayer for it. Maybe this is not too big, but get help. Uh, we want to sustain our family relationships. And when we say family, we also want you to, uh, you know, we have family, Hare Krishna, but yeah, my mother was a Baptist. And my mother said the most disappointing do I have much time in here? One second. Right. My mother said <laughs> the most disappointing thing that ever I ever said to her was because of my religious belief, I had an opportunity to have a ticket on the boat. And because she didn't have, she didn't have a ticket on the she couldn't get a ticket on the boat unless she had my religious belief that I couldn't help her and I just had to say bye mom and ride on that boat and just gone. Do you and she told me years later, she said that's the most disappointing thing you ever said to me, that you would leave me behind. You we have to think about what we're saying to our parents. Just because we you know so what I learned is give her the ticket. And guess where I, re I really, really learned that I was okay to believe like that? Right here in this community. Was it Prahlad? Was it Prahlad? Prince, Prince Julva. Julva. Prince and Julva. Prahlad. And Prahlad. They say, don't come after me. I'm just my words, of course. Don't come get me, Lord, until everybody. And if you look around, and ain't nobody else left, then I go. If, so if we have that kind of attitude, we're going to have patience with each other. We're going to have really genuine affection. If you're willing to give up your ticket and let mom go, that's your mother. She birthed you. And it's <laughs> it's a lot of spiritual to all this too. It may be that that's how you get your ticket that you're willing to give it up. So. Uh, notions with parenting, parenting is the uh, skills of a healthy family, and then we have a <coughs> children. <coughs> and I got one minute for that, right? <laughs> <laughs> children's needs. Children's needs. They have physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual needs. We got a little less here, it can go longer. So what's the physical need of a child? Physical need. They need what? They need nurturing. And clothing. Clothing. Let's see it more. It's physical. I can grab it. Nurturing. Maybe nursing, but it may be just saying hi, hi. So physical is that clothes, milk. Uh, do we want to give our children cow milk? Or because cow is beautiful, right? Cows. Do we want to give a cow milk as a preference? Not when they're babies. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, answer this. You can answer, you know, you know, yeah, if you give them the breast milk first. I know that, I'm not even a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, you, if you're given something to use and you don't use it, what are you supposed to happen to it? Uh, go, away. go away, they're going to cut them off. Aren't they cutting them off these days, right and left? Right and left. <laughs> They're cutting them off, right? Because they're not being used. I mean, you can't do nothing with them. So we have to use those items. So emotional... <laughs> it's real. Emotional needs, such as fairness and respect. Be fair when you're dealing with your children. Intellectual needs. How are they, one of the uh, things that really helped our children intellectually is just like with Prahlad. Prahlad was uh, indicated to be a bigger demon than his father. But because of Scripture being read to him on a daily basis, he came to be spiritually astute and sharp, intellectual, right? So that's what we should do with our children. And it'll put them in Princeton and other things like that. How do I know that? Well, 
the two, we have two imprints to write down. So we read scripture on a regular basis. It's one of the keys. And so there's spiritual needs. There's uh, activities that address children's needs. There's good discipline. You want but this, the word in discipline is what? I'm going to ask you one more time. The word in discipline is what? Lack of discipline? Disciple. 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 Who said that? Raise your hand. The word in discipline is disciple. So when you are disciplining your child, you are continually uh, educating and supporting that child to be a good disciple. It's not punishment. So then we have making routines and rules, and then we have our next class. Okay? So our next uh, presenter is Praharan Devi, and she's going to be talking about how grasses can and should make a social contribution. One of the most challenging things about Grihasta life is that you're actually not living in a temple ashram, protected from the world. You're actually interacting with the world. You're working, you're living outside, and you're dealing with all the material energy. Um, that can be a challenge, but it can also really um, help to develop spirituality and Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada said, you have to catch the fish without getting wet. So, living in the material world, in other words, you can preach, you can deal with the world, but don't get the material energy on yourself, if you can possibly do that, and of course, that's a skill. Um, what are some of the big sources of negative influences living outside the temple as a Grihasta couple? What, I know we talked about a few of them before when we were talking about um, lust, um, but what are some of the other things that come to your mind just very quickly, negative influences. Mm-hmm. Movies. Mm-hmm. Music. Mm-hmm. Music. Other people. Yeah. Non-devotees <laughs> and their, their habits or their thoughts. And, yeah. For jumping on. For jumping yeah. yeah, that's it. Internet. Uh, newspapers. Um, food. The food that's in your face all the time. Awful smells half the time. Okay, so obviously there's a lot. And um, just a few little statistics. I know I haven't got much time, but um, most American children, and Canadian I suppose too, (laughs) ages 2 to 17, watch TV over 24 hours a week. 24 hours, 60% of the TV shows contain violence. 28% of children's shows contain four or more violent acts. (coughs) It's horrendous what the kids' minds are being filled with. 75% of music videos are explicit sexual imagery. These are our teenagers, including young kids. 50% depict violence, tobacco, alcohol use. Um, The average American child watches 40,000 commercials a year. And... um, 59% 59% of girls and 73% of boys, age 9, when they did a poll, stated that their favorite games are the ones that are the most violent. Mm-hmm. So that's what happens when they watch all this violence all the time. Um, so yeah, that's what you deal with in raising your family, and those are the influences that bombard you every day. Um, so you have to try to stay aloof from the material pressures and allurements, but it's very difficult, especially for children. That's why they need such strong guidance and um, association. So being a, a householder, we're living, uh, we're living outside the temple in a society. That's an amazing chance for preaching. That's, uh, you can have a huge, huge role in positive change in your community. And many, many householders have, have, um, have done these things. All kinds of preaching programs, all kinds of influence. Um, just wanted to read a... Something that actually I went to Charlie Preaching by example. Advaita Charya set an ideal example for our, all householder devotees in his reception of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his devotees in his execution of a daily festival at his home. If one is the proper means and wealth, we talked about that. 
He should occasionally invite the devotees of Lord Chaitanya who are engaged in preaching all over the world and hold a festival at his home simply by distributing prasadam, talking about Krishna during the day, and holding congregational chanting for at least three hours in the evening. This procedure must be adopted in all centers of Krishna consciousness movement. From Chaitanya Charitamrita. So in the course, what we do is we get uh, the devotees, uh, the couples to sort of talk to each other, um, the single devotees to talk to each other, and make definite plans about what preaching activities they're going to do. List them, set timelines, and then report to each other what they've done, what they need to do, and what's, what's the future activities. To get people rolling and enthusiastic about preaching activities. Actually, householders can be extremely influential as preachers. And if you look in our scriptures, it's the householders who, who are doing a tremendous amount of preaching and influencing of society. So um, our course helps you think about all that kind of thing. So the final lesson uh, that we have in the course is uh, balanced lifestyles again, and it's talking about personal sadhana and spirituality. How many of us have had to juggle with that issue? Uh, that we have so many other duties and responsibilities, but we got to chant our 16 rounds. We want to read so many scriptures. We want to uh, be in Mangala Arctic if, if, you know, if that's one of the available things to us. So juggling this idea of our spirituality at the same time, maintaining a healthy family life and doing our duties is a very, very crucial element. And a lot of devotees wrestle with that. <coughs> So in the course, we break into groups and we talk about ways that those different issues can be negotiated. We have the devotees to come up with ideas, even uh, tried and true or experimental, that might work. And we, we talk about being practical, things that really you can do. We have goals that we make and we have steps to achieve those goals. So we want to have you all do a group exercise really quick. But just before that, I'd like to read a couple of quotes from Srila Prabhupada and Srila Bhaktivinoda. Uh, Srila Bhaktivinoda said, Marriage with a view to a peaceful and virtuous life and with a view to procreate servants of the Lord is a good institution for a Vaishnava. And then Prabhupada says, There are many purificatory processes for advancing in human life to spiritual life. The marriage ceremony, for example, is one of these sacrifices. The Lord says that any sacrifice which is meant for human welfare should never be given up. The marriage ceremony is meant to regulate the human mind to become peaceful for spiritual advancement. And finally, Prabhupada uh, says in a letter to one of his disciples that he um, would give his blessings for marriage if the couples would take counseling. So one of the main uh, initiatives we have is to encourage couples before they get married to um, find a qualified counselor or marriage educator and get premarital skill building counseling. Because that's very crucial to help the marriage. Okay. So all of you were given when you came in the little brochure with the 12 principles. And so we just like you all to break into groups of three and each one... Um, Take one of the principles, so you be one, you be two, you all can be uh, three, you all can be four, let you all be five, six, seven, five, eight, all you all together, nine, ten, and 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 Example 
So that principle, either from your own experiences or perhaps scripture. But we'd like it to be from your own experiences. Okay? So who personally that through maintaining association with devotees it has changed uh, my personal the way I deal with myself and the way that I deal with others. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. What I'm sorry to do the time. Okay, number three is number three. Okay. Hi Krishna. Um the principle I wanted to talk about was commitment and dedication. And uh, the example that uh, 
I observed was uh, were my parents basically. Um, you know, while we were growing up, um, e even today they are so uh, committed and dedicated to each other. They have a wonderful, you know, sense of uh, division of uh, uh, responsibilities. Like for example, uh, my mom she used to take care of uh, you know the educational aspects. Mm -hmm. Our schooling till mm -hmm. till a particular uh, grade. After that, we started taking care of it ourselves. But on the other hand, my dad he used to t if there were any financial considerations or you know work activities, so he used to take care of all those activities. And then um, you know through so so one one point that is made here is with determination and unshakable commitment, one can surmount the inevitable hard times that come in married life. I remember when I was very small. Uh, my, I mean, we were not very well off financially, but uh, and and my dad had just uh, was buying a new house. So each and every single uh, in India rupee that was uh, saved. So so they used to they had this commitment that okay you know we are going to uh, we are going to buy a new house. So both of them used to put in a lot of effort to save money just so that you know they can uh, buy the house and. Uh, and and uh, yeah, my parents had a uh, arranged marriage, but I can definitely say they have a lot of love for each other because you can see that through the uh, through the. Uh, I mean, as we were growing up, uh, the sense of uh, respect that we felt for our father was inculcated in us through our mother. So basically, she she used to uh, uh, you know she used to praise our father whenever she was alone with us and that inculcated in us a strong sense of respect for our father uh, and and vice versa so even when my dad used to talk to us he would he would always praise my mom so because of that we have a we have a strong sense of respect for each other yeah. so so good. because of that i thought this particular very very okay number 4 Okay. Um, so positive and real, uh, realistic vision. You talked about um, support from your elders and how important it is to, to you know, take shelter of these people that have gone through these you know, times that we're going through. Just like Tariq was saying, is that why do we know? Because this person has been through it. So we can take, you know, it's really important to have these the elders in our communities and stuff like that and know that we can come to them and feel like, you know, there's they know that we we need them and they feel you know appreciated that that we can go to them you know so that's what we do thank you number five if you'll come up that'll be okay yeah help our camera so uh, number five what do we have is mutual respect and appreciation and uh, this is at least in my mind, is the key to a good, healthy relationship because uh, if we don't respect each other, there will be no, how to say, no love existing or you, you cannot develop love or, you know, in the case of arranged marriage or, you know, when the, there is some attraction. If there is only attraction, there is no respect for each other, it doesn't last for long. So this is like the uh, basic key. The example in, in, in life. Uh, one more thing uh, about the respect is not only that we respect the person, uh, but we respect also how the person performs his duties as the husband or as a wife. The, the, the wife has its own role in the family and the husband has uh, his own role in the family. So we respect uh, not only as a person, but also how they... Uh, the, you know the, their service mm -hmm. for the family, and we try to encourage them and etc. And um, you know what, Prabhu? That's I think that because we have so many. Yeah. Yeah. that's good. I, that, it fits that's everywhere good. besides. Yeah. The, it fits in all of us. Very well said. Side up for the course. Oh, and anybody have a question? We'll behind and answer any questions you have. And if you're from a temple where you would like to take information back to whoever could arrange the course, I have a few information folders here. We're doing a special discount for one year, the DVT 
uh, made a, a tremendous decision to sacrifice, and we're doing the course for very, very inexpensive cost. It's barely covering our cost. So we want all the Vaishnav communities, all the temples to take advantage of this year to have some uh, presentation of the course in your community. So any and years. everybody could take the course, whether you're married, thinking about being married, individuals. We think that everyone should take this course and have this knowledge, this training, so that you can strengthen the grass to ashram. For any of you who cannot take the course, that are in a position to sponsor someone taking the course, send a donation to Gras Division Team so that it help pay for these courses. We have some uh, uh, visions of how we would like to have at least one of one couple that can travel throughout the United States and be, and give these courses in different cities. And so Canada. In Canada. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's part of the United States too. <laughs> <laughs> we won't start there. <laughs> we have a few brochures here as well, if you'd like. One's called Strong Marriages Have Seven Vital Ingredients, Five Tips for Parents, A Potential Spouse, What to Look For. Now, how many of you are now enthusiastic about taking this course? Yeah. Yeah.